I'm, I'm sorry for the delay at the beginning, and I appreciate your patience. Uh, the, uh, we finally got all the bugs uh, taken out. I've, uh, I've given lectures in uh, 52 different countries about the subject that we're, uh, we're talking about today, uh, but this is my first experience with a webinar, and I think uh, the, uh, uh, the problems are a direct result of my, uh, my incompetence. Uh, for the last uh, several decades, I've been doing research on leadership and decision making, and uh, it's uh, I think it's uh, it's powerful work. Uh, it's had an impact on uh, on leaders around the world, and I'm happy to be able to uh, share some of the highlights uh, with you today. Uh, this work began with um, with some research that I was doing in which I asked every manager, every leader that I could find to tell me about uh, uh, about two decisions that they had made, one uh, which was highly successful and one of which was a failure. And uh, it was easier for people to think about their successes than about their failures. But uh, uh, but eventually, I got virtually well, roughly a thousand leaders to, to to tell me about a success experience and a failure experience. Uh, the slide that you should uh, be seeing now uh, is a result of that research, and it shows the uh, processes that people used uh, in in making decisions. Uh, Ali, I'm going to ask you, uh, my slide is not completely um, uh, clear. There uh, is, a, is a file view box which is blocking one half of my slide. Uh, that's okay for me, but I hope it's not true for uh, the participants. Can you answer that question? Uh, can you come again? Exactly. I mean, what I'm seeing right now is um, a leadership okay. making styles, and it has a yeah. manager central leadership at the bottom with a blue arrow. Yeah. 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 So I think it's okay. Oh, okay. We are even All right. The slide All right. Number two. I'm just going to close this box here. No, I don't want to leave the webinar. Okay. Now, these uh, these alternative ways of make, making decisions are uh, described along a scale in terms of the amount of uh, opportunity to influence the decision, uh, which the manager's team or the leader's team had. At the, the left-hand side, where uh, the value was zero, uh, the, um, the, the manager's team had no influence whatsoever on the, the decision. This is sometimes referred to as autocratic decision-making or uh, sometimes authoritarian decision-making in which the, the manager makes the decision, announces it to, uh, to everyone else. Uh, I hate to use those words autocratic and authoritarian. Uh, I'm a sailor in my, my leisure time, and uh, I sail uh, around the world on, the, on my boat, and uh, this is a style that it is alleged that I use as soon as I step aboard the boat. I'm the decision maker. I shout the orders, and the members of uh, my team, usually family members and sometimes close friends, uh, do the work on the slippery foredeck of the boat, and uh, it works very well. So uh, I don't use the term autocratic. Instead, I talk about decide, uh, which means the I have all of the influence in the decision. Then we come to a couple of processes that begin with the term consult, and now members of my team have uh, are, my, are my consultants. Before the decision is made, they have their opportunities to uh, influence the decision. Uh, either individually, a set of one-on-one -on -one conversations, or as a group. But in, in both cases, I am the decision maker, but after they have had their say, their opportunity to influence the decision. Uh, the next step over along this continuum is even more participative than that. It's called facilitate. And now the group is makes the decision, but the, the role of the leader uh, is to control the process, but not the final decision. 
Uh, it's an attempt to get consensus, to get a meeting of the minds, uh, or at the least to get a decision that everyone can live with. And the, the final alternative is called delegate. And here the leader does not play a role in the decision. Uh, turns it over to the group and they are the decision makers. Uh, the numbers that you will see along the scale refer to what most people believe and our research has shown to be the relative amounts of influence which each of these uh, alternative decision processes provides to uh, the, uh, the uh, uh, provides in the decision. Uh, and with the aid of these, these numbers, one can uh, average over decisions and see how autocratic or decisive a leader was in comparison with others. The re research has shown us that no one of these processes is best under all circumstances. Uh, that what is absolutely critical is to match your decision-making process with the nature of the situation. Um, and uh, this is absolutely critical for, for effectiveness and it's called a, a situational view of decision making. And our research certainly confirms uh, that, uh, that view. But it's important to go beyond that and look and see how one can transfer this sort of vague statement that everyone can agree with into uh, some more concrete actions that are available to the manager. And I've had two goals in uh, this research. Looking at the left-hand side of the scale, I've been concerned with developing a normative or a prescriptive model that um, purports to provide a roadmap to managers about what situations call for different kinds of leadership practices, uh, autocratic at one end, and highly participative at the other end. And uh, before the webinar is over, I'll be showing you something called expert system, which is a tool which uh, results from the research, which, uh, w which managers can uh, use and are using to, uh, to calibrate their, uh, their style or decision-making process with the challenges which they face. At the right-hand side of the page, where you see the word descriptive, uh, he, this reflects my second goal, to provide a means of understanding what people do, uh, understanding such questions as what cultural differences are there in, uh, in, in leadership practices. Uh, and most particularly, how can we describe the, uh, the decision processes of a manager in such a way as to compare them with one another and to compare them with the uh, normative or the prescriptive model. And I've developed a, a technology uh, for this, which I'm, I call decision making for leaders, and I'll go into it in uh, more detail. And it's an essential part of all the seminars that I conduct in which people can receive a um, um, an assessment of their own own leadership style in a form which they can compare it with expert system and compare it with uh, with other managers in their organization and with other kinds of organizations and I'll be talking about this in uh, just a few minutes there are four separable criteria uh, of effectiveness that are, that are determined by where you are on this scale. The choice you make of how much involvement, how inclusive is your decision-making process, how much do you involve other people, has effects on all four of these factors. The first of these, and the most important, is the quality of the decision. Uh, this is the extent to which the decision is consistent with uh, with the facts that are available and consistent with the goals we're trying to obtain and consistent with potentially available information about the effects of the uh, processes on, on coming up with a, a well-reasoned decision. But that's not the only determinant of effectiveness because many 
high quality decisions have failed miserably because they have lacked the second component, the uh, understanding of and commitment on the part of the people who are affected by the decision have to work with it and to make it work. We also need to be concerned with the implementation of the decision, uh, the extent to which the process which was used in the making of the decision creates the necessary commitment and understanding of the decision by group members. That too is affected by where you are on the scale. And the two of these combine into something that I'm going to call uh, decision effectiveness. But we should also be concerned with the uh, resources that are used up in the process of making the decision. There are costs with decision-making processes. And here the principal cost is one of time. Um, was the decision made in a timely fashion? Or did it consume more time on the part of group members and of the leader than was absolutely necessary? As you move from the left to the right along the scale, as you involve other people more, as you obtain their, their commitment and support, you uh, slow down the decision-making process. And uh, if uh, this is an emergency, you want fast decisions. And uh, if the decision, this often happens, by the way, on a sailboat, uh, where I have to make uh, very fast decisions, or else we would, uh, as some of my crew members say, bet the boat. The last alternative was one that most managers don't think about. Uh, and it was brought home to me in, uh, in a fairly dramatic fashion. I recall a few years ago receiving a, a phone call from my eldest son uh, who lived in San Francisco, and he asked me uh, if I was going to be using the sailboat, uh, that even which is leadership, by the way. Uh, the dinghy is called followership. Uh, if, if I was, was going to be uh, using leadership uh, the first week in September, which in America is called Labor Day weekend. And I recall pulling out my Blackberry and uh, looking at it and uh, seeing that I had no plans. And I said, uh, no, Derek, uh, why do you, you ask? And he said, well, I went to a party last night with a group of my friends. They've never been sailing. And we all have that week off. And he said, uh, what I'd like to do is to, to take the boat and uh, sail it up the Atlantic coast and uh, go to Canada and a few islands that we've never seen. And I almost had an anxiety attack. I, uh, I, uh, I said, uh, uh, well, uh, let me think about this. And uh, he said, well, hold the boat for me. I think this would be great. Thanks, Dad. Hung up the phone. And I thought I was uh, was going to be uh, uh, this anxiety attack just overwhelmed me. And then I asked myself, why do I feel so anxious in turning over the boat to my eldest son, who uh, at the, the, the time was 20 years old and uh, had lots of experience. He'd probably sailed 4,000 miles aboard that boat. Why should I feel anxious in turning it over to me? And all of a sudden, it, I realized the cause. It was my leadership style. He'd never brought the boat into a dock. That was my job. He never decided when to change sails. That was my job, and so on and so forth. He was much better on a slippery foredeck when the boat is heeling at about 65 degrees, changing sails. But he'd never had an experience, any experience in performing the leadership functions, largely because I hadn't involved him in the doing of these. I perform, I viewed these as solitary functions that I would, well, the point I'm trying to make with this rather crude example, but true, uh, is that as you move over to the, to the um, uh, right-hand side of the scale, you are increasing people's abilities to make decisions. You are forming teams because they work together in the process of solving problems. And you also have the effect of aligning goals with the goals of the organization. People begin to feel as though the organization, whether it's a boat or, uh, 
or a firm uh, is their firm, is their organization, and the organization's goals become its goals. So it increases the value of the human assets of the organization. Well, these four things are affected by where one is on the scale. Now, for some purposes, uh, I make a distinction between two ways of combining these factors. One is called a time-driven model, which is uh, managing for today. It ignores the developmental component, which I ignored for years on the sailboat. Uh, it wants to use the uh, uh, the fast decision-making process for getting a high-quality decision, which will be implemented effectively. And this comes pretty close to what many managers do. And I'm going to contrast that with a, um, a development-driven, uh, I'm having trouble in operating one of the keys on my computer and going down to the next, I don't know what has happened here. Um, Um, any advice from anybody here? Uh, I can't, uh, I'm not able to, I can just a minute. Okay. Now, now I've, uh, for some reason I've uh, solved the problem. The um, our, our research has, has led us to identify uh, 11 factors uh, which need to be considered in deciding where to position yourself on the scale. Uh, and I've shown them here in the form of a, uh, a, uh, a balance diagram. Think of this as a scale and think of the arrow at the top uh, as, uh, as influenced by the weights at the left-hand side and the weights at the right-hand side. Uh, we'll start off at the left-hand side. Uh, if the leader has all of the knowledge that is needed to solve the problem from a technical standpoint, uh, that in, in and of itself should move the arrow over toward a, a, a more participative process. Uh, the next factor, if the leader has a high likelihood of gaining commitment to his or her own solutions, has the power to make their own solution. And the components are, uh, do the team members view the leader as the expert? Is the leader charismatic? Uh, has the leader seen by others as having the, uh, the, the legitimate right to make the decision? Uh, these will influence the extent to which uh, the uh, the leader can rely on the group for uh, for implementing an autocratic solution. Importance of time as the time factor becomes more important, uh, that too should move the arrow over to the left hand side. And if there is an interaction constraint, and by that I mean some uh, geographical constraint or even a time constraint which makes it impossible to bring people together in the process, that too should move the arrow over to the left-hand side. The factors on the right-hand side should move the arrow over toward the, uh, the right. If the group has the needed knowledge or expertise, if the group member's goals are aligned with the goals of the organization, if they want what's best for the organization, if it's going to be critical to gain their commitment to the solution in order for it to be implemented effectively, or if you value their development, and finally, if they have worked together as a team, those factors should move the recommended style toward a more participative process. The two factors in the middle determine the, the sensitivity of that point. They can go both ways. The bigness of the decision, that's decision significance. If this is a, a, a question of survival of the organization 
or if it's a very important organization where it's critical to get it right, the decision is highly significant. If it's a com cosmetic decision, such as uh, what color do we paint the walls in the bathroom, uh, or what games do we play at, at the department picnic, uh, uh, those are of much lower significance. And if you combine a highly significant decision with the factors at the left, uh, it will move the arrow even more toward the, uh, the uh, left-hand side of the continuum. If you combine a highly significant decision with factors at the right, that will move the arrow more quickly. The same thing is true of likelihood of disagreement. Now, this is the uh, uh, view of the software, uh, which is contained on the CD-ROM, and uh, roughly 10,000 managers around the world have uh, got copies of this or a related CD-ROM uh, that I have developed. Uh, of late, I have been uh, for providing those who want to use the software with a, a link such that they can do it online. And uh, now, if you look at the factors at the, the left-hand side, you find uh, things which will teach you how to use the model. Uh, we'll explain uh, uh, various decision processes, the meaning of the situational factors, uh, a bibliography of the research that went into the development of the software. Uh, this was not something that I invented uh, on, a, on a given afternoon. Uh, it, uh, there was something of the order of uh, 150 scientific studies uh, all published in, in, in reputable journals which have gone into uh, the formulation of the model. The model is not perfect. It doesn't guarantee uh, an effective uh, decision, uh, but those decisions which are consistent with the model have roughly a three to four times higher uh, F, uh, success rate than those decisions which are inconsistent with the model. Uh, show you a bit more. Uh, in, in order to use the model, you take each of the uh, uh, 11 uh, factors and you rate its importance on a five-point scale. And having done that, you click on Calculate, and it produces a bar graph, which looks like this, which for this particular configuration says that consult group is likely to be uh, the uh, most in most uh, valuable process. Um, there's much more to the software than I can show you here, uh, but this is expert system. And uh, it's uh, been, been shown to be uh, very effective in helping people to increase the quality of the decision. I do not see managers um, using the software forever. In fact, if you use it four or five times, you, it's the process of asking yourself the questions about where the information resides, uh, about the importance of time, the importance of development, and so on, which gets Im embedded into the, the manager's thinking process. Without the aid of the model, most managers uh, think about three or four aspects uh, before they decide how much to involve others, or perhaps just do it automatically. Uh, but this ensures that uh, all of the bases will, uh, will be touched and that all the relevant considerations. Uh, so it's, a, it's essentially a training device. Now, I'm, I'm going to leave the model and move to something that I think is even more powerful that is a part of, uh, of all of my seminars. It's a means by which managers can assess their own leadership style. Uh, it's be, before coming to a course, a manager sits down on the internet uh, in front of a set of 30 short but real cases, each described in a paragraph or so. Each is a real situation uh, that I've uh, observed in my own research. And uh, these cases are not a random assortment. 
rather they vary in each of the situational factors that a manager should think about prior to choosing an effective decision-making process. So in half of the cases, the manager has all of the information that is needed in order to make an effective decision. In half of the cases, the manager is over his or her head. Uh, in half of the cases are high conflict cases. There's lots of disagreement about what ought to be done among the members of the manager's team. In the other half of the cases, their group is in high agreement. There are a great deal of harmony, um, and so on and so forth. So the cases have been translated into a great many different languages. Uh, they're available in Arabic, they're available in Chinese, they're available in Pol Polish and in Danish and in uh, French and in Spanish, so the manager can choose his or her choice of language. And uh, it, it typically takes oh, approximately an hour to go through each of the cases, uh, and you're asked which process you would use, which of the five processes you would use if you were the individual faced with that situation. You don't have to do all of the cases at the same time. Uh, typically, managers do four or five at a time. But prior to coming to the course, they uh, they have uh, they did all 30 of them, which enables us to produce uh, uh, an individualized 12-page color report for that manager. Uh, the nature uh, of the report shows how the managers compare with his or her peers, that is, people from the same organization, and also with a comparison group. Uh, and we have a database of roughly a quarter million managers from around the world uh, who have gone through, through this, some public sector managers, some private sector, some in uh, in uh, each of the important industries uh, in the world and ranging from uh, high, high level chief executive officer down to uh, fairly low level managers. So we choose an appropriate uh, comparison group. And finally, they're compared with expert system with what the model would recommend. So they can see in what, uh, in what uh, what instances they are in perfect agreement with the model, and in what they differ from the model. Finally, uh, because these cases are varied, uh, the situational factors are varied across the cases, the manager is able to see what factors he pays attention to and what factors he ignores. And uh, finally, this 12-page report concludes with a set of individualized recommendations to the manager about, uh, about how to increase his effectiveness in, this, in leadership and decision-making. Uh, I'll show you some examples. There, there are 12 pages, and in the course of these 12 pages, there are something, I think the number is 20, uh, colored uh, slides. Uh, this is uh, how the manager compares with peers. Each one of these asterisks is uh, is one person in the manager's own uh, organization. The X is underneath the position of the individual manager. Uh, P is underneath the is the mean of the peer group. And uh, C is the comparison group, which uh, for this particular purpose was a group of uh, 500 CEOs from around the world. Um, now, the green area is uh, like the safe zone in Baghdad. It's the safe place to be. Uh, all, all of those managers who are in the green zone are, uh, are in between the time-driven model, which is the left edge of the green, and uh, the uh, development-driven model, which is the right end. Uh, those few managers in this particular organization, uh, one, two, three, four, five at the left-hand side, 
are a little too decisive or autocratic for their own, uh, they'd be maximally effective. And the three managers at the right hand side are a little too participative. Perhaps they've got more than uh, 24 hours in a day, but they uh, are uh, using a great deal of time uh, in the making of decisions. Uh, now this is one of the uh, of the slides. I'll show you uh, another. This is a very useful one, uh, which shows the manager's choice on each of the 30 cases and what the model would do on each of the 30 cases. And uh, where you see more than one green entry, the one to the left is uh, what the time-driven model would recommend. And one to the right would be the development-driven model. Uh, the manager is instructed to look and focus on the red X's, which are cases in which your behavior is uh, uh, at odds with the model. Uh, at the right hand side you see what risk you were taking and uh, the uh, the feedback that the manager receives is such that it is live electronically so the manager can put uh, the cursor on any one of these cases and click on it and it will bring up the actual case and it will show you how expert system handles the case. So the manager can see what factors he or she ignored and then can ask what what uh, what decisions does he make in his own job which are similar to this and what would the model recommend. So it's a quite a developmental experience. Uh, um, for each of the situational factors that the manager is uh, that, that varies across the cases and should be attended to. Um, the manager receives uh, feedback about which cases, which uh, situational factors influence their choices. And here uh, the manager sees how the existence of conflict affects his choices. As conflict increases, the manager moves toward the right-hand side of the scale. That's the uh, pink or the purple line which goes upward and to the right, which is the same direction as, uh, as the model. And uh, so that's the correct direction, although approximately three-quarters of the managers do exactly the reverse. The less the harmony and disagreement, the more the autocratic the manager is. So uh, the slope is the opposite and uh, is cause for uh, some concern. The, um, here we're looking to see where the manager, um, which of the criteria the manager pays most attention to. And now he's compared in percentile terms with the last uh, 15,000 managers who responded to this instrument. Uh, the green area at the right hand side uh, is the top uh, one third of all managers. Uh, the yellow is, uh, is the middle one third and the uh, pink dots are the lowest third. And if we look at the X's now we can see that uh, uh, this person does very well in terms of uh, the quality of the decision, but not nearly so well in terms of implementation. Uh, this is a characteristic that he shares, although to a lesser degree, with his peer group, P standing for peer. Uh, it's not shared with the CEOs who do equally well on quality and implementation. So one of the things that this manager needs to do is to pay more attention toward using a decision process that will provide uh, uh, commitment and understanding of the decisions that are made, uh, usually a greater degree of involvement. Uh, we also see that this manager is paying much more attention to time efficiency than to development. And uh, this is true of, uh, of the peer group 
but is not true of the CEOs. And finally, the recommendations. Each manager receives a personalized set of recommendations uh, about uh, what things he should do differently. And uh, in this case, the recommendations center around uh, development and commitment. Um, the manager is, is, is overestimating his uh, degree of charisma. Now, this is uh, the report, which is uh, much more comprehensive than I'm able to show you uh, here. Now, I'm going to share with you some things that we have learned uh, from now studying a quarter million leaders around the world. Um, the average manager of today uh, is shown here. It's approximately 4.4. This is averaging over all 30 of the cases. And just for comparison purposes, I've shown you where the time-driven model would recommend uh, the manager to be and where the development-driven model would be. And this looks like a, a, a very sensible pattern, uh, not exclusively time-driven, not exclusively development-driven, but paying about equal amount of attention to both. That's the typical manager of today at approximately, uh, approximately 4, 4.4. But what about yesterday? I first developed this technology at GE. Uh, in the early 1970s, and I had been tracking organizations over uh, the same organizations over that period of time, and there have been some changes. Back in uh, 1973, the average manager was at 2.8 on this scale, and uh, by the year 2010, it was up to its present level of 4.4. What is there that is changing leadership styles around the world, or at least in most countries in this world? Why are styles of leadership changing? Well, these are guesses on my part, but they're shared with a, a great many leaders around the world. Uh, one, one of them is globalization. Uh, as which has greatly increased the complexities of decisions. Uh, and as the complexity of the decision increases, it's got to be matched with more complex decision-making processes and, and uh, one which are able to bring more talent, more perspectives, more information to bear on the decision. The likelihood that a manager can have all of the information needed to deal with many of the complex decisions is much less today than it was in, uh, in uh, 20 or 30 years ago. Likewise, changes in the labor force. In most countries, the labor force has been increasing in educational level. And uh, along with increased education go um, more desire to be influenced, to have influence on decisions which have effects upon us. I think we can see this in the, in uh, in Arab Spring and the responses of particularly the youth in uh, in wanting more say in uh, the political decision making process. Um, also, there's been a change here. I say changing from from manufacturing to service. A movement toward knowledge work, uh, which requires more creativity, more thinking through new solutions to problems, as opposed to routinely implementing uh, existing practices. The fourth factor is uh, a flattened organization structure. Uh, I've been a consultant to GE for approximately 30 years. And when I first worked for GE, there were approximately 11 levels of management uh, from the bottom of the top. Uh, the, the pyramid was was very, uh, well, it was not just all flat. Uh, 
Jack Welch, the uh, CEO of uh, GE, decreed that there'd be no more than three or four levels between the bottom and the top. And it's gone a long way to, uh, to making this a part of the GE culture. And along with a flattened structure goes more opportunities for participation and decision making. The final factor is information technology, um, uh, which uh, makes it possible for one to get uh, information pertinent to uh, the solution of organizational problems uh, sent laterally across the organization in uh, microseconds. One of the, uh, the factors that, uh, that we have studied with this huge database is, uh, and the factor which accounts for the greatest amount of variance, is one's country or one's culture. And here on the scale, I have uh, arrayed the uh, various countries in which I have enough data um, along the scale from 0 to 10. Now, I've spread them out uh, by putting emerging markets at zero. I don't mean they are at zero. They are approximately at a, about, uh, about two or two and a half. Um, and I don't mean that uh, Japan is at 10. Uh, Japan is approximately uh, six and a half to seven. But I spread them out for aesthetic reasons. But if I wanted to know how autocratic or participative a manager was, the first question I would ask is what country is, is the manager from? Now, I have not put, uh, put Saudi Arabia here on this scale. Uh, um, the data I have from Saudi Arabia is largely been uh, from people at very senior levels in uh, done uh, a lot of work uh, for the young president's organization in uh, Bahrain and in Saudi Arabia. Uh, I've done a lot of work with uh, senior members of management in the UAE uh, in, uh, and uh, they are um, they're fairly autocratic but considering the, uh, the, the complexities of the work, I, I should also have, have pointed out that as one moves up in the organization from lower levels of management to higher levels, one tends to move across this scale toward more participative practices. Well, I've probably used more than the 30 minutes, and uh, but I understand that there m must be, and I would welcome an opportunity to hear what questions that uh, you uh, have. So I'm going to keep quiet at this point. There's a lot more that I could say and will deal with when uh, uh, in the course of a seminar. But if you have any questions, now is the time to ask them. Anybody got a question? OK. Uh, yeah. Are you open the floor for questions now? Sure. Let me see. Okay, folks, if you have any questions, you can raise your hand. Uh, there is a hand icon uh, on your webinar console, so if you click on it, I will be able to unmute you one by one, and you will be able to speak up. Uh, let me see. We have our first hand, which has been raised now by Mr. Junaid Khan. Let me try to unmute him. Hi, Junaid, can you hear us? Hi, I can hear you. All right, Junaid, could you please introduce yourself uh, and from where you're calling, and then please uh, ask your question to Dr. Ekta. Yeah, thank you, Ali. Uh, myself, Junaid Ahmad Khan. I'm working in uh, Riyadh uh, with Obekan uh, Industrial Group as finance manager, mm -hmm. uh, especially working for in the, in, in the uh, industrial division and pip, uh, printing industry. We are one of the biggest different, uh, printing industry in Saudi Arabia and Middle East, okay. uh, catering mostly the need of all the Ministry of Education books. Okay. I am working there as finance manager. My voice is clear? Yeah, yes. yes absolutely. Absolutely. What is your question, Dimit? 
Uh, actually, uh, I believe at the last slide, uh, Victor has already cleared it uh, that I wanted to know in which area, based on his study, the Saudi Arabian industries and market is falling. Uh, what is the what is the rating of Saudi Arabian industries and business uh, if we if he uh, scales it uh, this market? This and lastly, he has already given the answer. But I'll I will request him to elaborate a little more. Certainly, uh, I have. It's been a while since I've been in Riyadh, uh, but uh, I had the opportunity. Uh, one of the participants in the uh, Young Presidents Organization invited me to uh, to uh, conduct a seminar with members of uh, his organization, and um, yeah, the. Um, as I remember the data, and I, it's been a while since I have been in Riyadh, um, the president was was quite participative and very similar to uh, those that I've found in other countries. Uh, but the organization itself was very top down, and uh, and the further you went down in, in the organization, the more autocratic people were. And uh, so it was quite quite different. Uh, now I I think I did about a two day seminar. <laughs> I see. I, I hear. <laughs> okay, I'm, I'm, I'm temporarily <laughs> mute, I, Nate. I think there was some background noise. So anyhow, please continue. <laughs> <laughs> yes, I, I, the, uh, the the organization itself was uh, was quite was quite uh, command and control and uh, and I hope they learned something about that uh, uh, it, I remember it was a very uh, uh, a very fun I think it was about two or three days in length uh, and uh, it was I felt as though I had considerable influence on the organization does that answer your question Jeanette? let me unmute him Let's see if that goes. yes Jeanette, is, is it clear now I mean, so, hello. The voice was not very clear, uh, but actually, I have little more. Uh, if, uh, another question, if you allow me, please. Huh? Uh, yeah. Okay. Maybe if you can, uh, if you can be a bit brief, also. Sure. Please go. Ahead. Hello. Yeah. Yeah. Hello? You, please go I'm ahead. Here. Go ahead. Yeah. Uh, uh, you are, I believe, talking uh, something uh, related to, especially uh, a normal business related. Uh, cases where we can talk about human resources or some normal day-to-day uh, -day businesses. Uh, once we, being in finance, once we are uh, discussing and taking majorly uh, decisions related to financial investments, uh, then uh, how much your uh, model can help us? Uh, can you please elaborate a little bit? Um, well, I, I, uh, uh, finance managers are probably my most uh, frequent client um, the uh, I have been uh, of late I've been doing work for Deloitte uh, who uh, uh, who work e exclusively with finance managers uh, and they bring them to, to their training center uh, in in Dallas Texas and uh, I have the pleasure of, uh, of spending a couple of days with them and giving them giving them feedback. Uh, finance managers tend to be quite uh, top-down and uh, decisive in their decision-making practices. Um, they are at one extreme. At the other extreme, one would find R&D managers, uh, one would find HR managers, uh, but, but finance managers um, uh, tend to have have a lot to learn, uh, and uh, I've uh, been been happy to uh, have worked with lots of groups of finance managers, and they report that they've learned a great deal. Of the thirty cases, they aren't just human resource cases; they they're they're cases that have come from from uh, from finance groups uh, from all parts of the organization. And uh, some of them are from not-for-profit organizations. Some of them are from 
uh, from, uh, from governmental organizations, you have your opportunity to put yourself in the position of a great many leaders in different sectors and to figure out what you would do if you were in their shoes. I hope that's, uh, that's an answer to your question. Uh, well, Junaid, uh, uh, do you have any supplementary or, or otherwise you can move to the other questions? People are waiting in the queue. Okay. Okay. It's okay. Please move to another problem. All right. Thank you very much, Junaid. Thank, thank, thank you very much. Bye. Thank you. All right. Let's see. We have another participant, Mr. Abdul Qadir. Let me try to unmute you. Mr. Abdul Qadir, can you hear us? Hello. Can you hear me? Yes, Mr. Kader, uh, could you please introduce yourself and where you're calling from and please ask a question to Dr. Ekdal. Good evening, everybody. Uh, my name is... Hello. Uh, I'm looking for... Uh, can you hear me? Yes, we can hear you. Uh, I, I can hear you, yes, yeah. Okay, uh, my name is Kader. Uh, I work for ETA Group. I'm on Qatar, uh, Doha. I have a one uh, tricky question related to and the decision king for us. What I have seen in my life, I've just uh, I've got uh, hardly say ten of experience uh, and decision making process. I've seen there's a conflict in between these two personalities. The leadership and con uh, I mean uh, this speaking personalities. What I mean to say is that people often used to dictate data just because of the position and their uh, designation, whereas a decision making process is supposed to be a process that should support the system should be in favor of the advice, should be in favor of the organization. But not just a profitability factor like what you were just discussing about account managers or the finance managers where they were giving priority to the organization has to generate. But what the question is, like how the leadership uh, can management or top management or the decision makers uh, can uh, do a bad process taking runs. I am some HR department and supporting web departments. We uh, have issues like uh, you know the top management need to think about uh, you know what sense they can take care of their employees and what sense this uh, human capital can act as an asset to the organization and they can help the organization to develop do or uh, uh, do much better. Can just let me know this. Uh, Dr. Victor, uh, Abdul Qadir, you were also a bit breaking up, so let me ask if, if uh, Dr. Victor could hear you clearly. Doctor, did you understand the question? Uh, no, he, uh, I heard it breaking up. Uh, um, I, I know it had to do with with um, with the human capital, and uh, that came through clearly. And uh, with what what leadership can uh, can do to increase the human capital, that 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 part of it, I understood. But uh, like you, it was breaking up uh, a yeah. great deal. Uh, okay, uh, Abdul Qadir, we'll give you another opportunity. Could you just uh, briefly and shortly and precisely ask the question because I think your voice is breaking up. Otherwise, I'll, uh, I'll give you the opportunity to put, put your question in the chat box and I'll read it for you. But go ahead, please ask the question once again. In a, uh, okay, uh, see, how can we synchronize the process, the leadership and the decision making for the power management? Uh, how can we synchronize the process for the leadership and the leadership and the decision making process for the top management? How can we synchronize the uh, uh, decision making process for the senior leadership and top management? Well, the um, uh, in in one of the slides that I showed, uh, the, um, the the top managers which were 500 CEOs, paid a great deal more importance to the development-driven model than to the time-driven model. They were less concerned with making decisions quickly 
than they were then with then involving others in such a means as to develop the human capital on the part of their chief executive team. And uh, the human human capital is reflected in 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 greater uh, capacity to make decisions themselves, um, greater ability to work together collegially in the interests of the organization, to work together as a team, and uh, to bind each of the members of the top management team into the organization so that uh, their goals were were identical with the organization's goals. And uh, this I do find, certainly not on the part of all CEOs, and if it were if it were true of all CEOs, then I guess I would be out of a job because uh, my I view my role as really helping people to view their their responsibilities a bit a bit differently, uh, and to make decisions in such a way that they're consistent with the long-term interests of their organization. Uh, I hope that would. I didn't hear all aspects of the of the question, but the parts of it that I think I understood uh, are uh, are contained in in that answer. Uh, I hope I uh, I was of some value. Yeah, I did you see the comment? Yeah, I. I, I, I Yes, I really I, one thing I want to discuss, I don't want to speak negative about the government info. Things like, uh, I feel uh, if the decision process is recurrent, I'm sure uh, if they can even consider with a group of people who are involved in the decision making process, that would do better. Like what you presented was, I agree with you. Okay. Thank you very much, Kader. So I hope I uh, would understand that you uh, you're satisfied with the answer, and so I can move it to the next uh, question questionnaire. Please, please. Okay. Thank you very much. Uh, okay, we have another one from Mr. Haytham Muhammad Khair. So let me try to unmute. Uh, Mr. Haytham Muhammad, uh, can you hear us? Hello, Mr. Haytham. Uh, Mr. Haytham just apparently went offline for timing, so let me move to the next question. Okay, Mr. Hatham is back. Mr. Hatham, can you hear us? Hello? It's Mohammed. Okay, let me move to the next one. Mr. Mr. Hamza Bilal, can you hear us? Uh, yes, I can. So, Hamza, can you please introduce yourself and from where you're calling? Uh, and and please ask a question to Dr. Victor. And please be, uh, I would request if you could be brief because we are just running out of the time and I have a few more questions that I need to ask. Sure, uh, thank you. I'm Hamza Bilal calling in from Bahrain. I'm a technical lead for a project with Ericsson over here. I had a very specific question with a background from technology uh, perspective. Sometimes we have to make difficult decisions, decisions that are bound to drive disagreement. Um, Keeping it brief, just just giving it an example for 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 a bit of an explanation. Apple in 1997 or 98, I presume, had to make a decision. Once Steve Jobs returned, they had to keep certain products and discard all the others. Now, this was a decision that was bound to drive disagreement within Apple, but a very significant decision because Apple couldn't continue with all those products. Uh, I would like Dr. Victor to uh, discuss the psychology of. Uh, the psychology of leadership that goes into, or that should go into such kind of decisions. Thank you. Sure, thank you. Uh, Victor, a good, well question, and, and we would request a short answer also, Victor, as we're running out of time. <laughs> well, uh, let, me, let me try that as I understand it. Uh, Stephen Jobs was a, a remarkable individual uh, and uh, had um, um, had tremendous um, uh, credibility uh, and and charisma within his organization, so uh, he had the ability to to make unpopular decisions and get the support of uh, his organization. That the people were behind him. Uh, he um, be because of 
is the past success uh, and virtually every product uh, he touched turned into gold and uh, uh, I wish that that more leaders had his his judgment and his ability to uh, obtain the, uh, the support and charisma uh, within his organization because it was possible for Steve Jobs to, to, to do some things that were uh, were temporarily uh, unpopular and went against the interests of, of other people, um, like getting rid of product. I, I'm I getting some noise. I don't know whether it's to my end or your end, but uh, yeah. that's about all of that I think I can say. Uh, Hamza, is it? Um Oh, do you have any supplementary, or is it okay to move ahead? Um, if you could, if you could uh, uh, advise us anything on the, on the psychology that goes into this kind of leadership, where we where hard decisions need to be taken as a necessity. Uh, well, the, the, the question is how to be charismatic, like Stephen Jobs. <laughs> uh, <laughs> that that's a hard one. Uh, the uh, and uh, I don't know how one acquires charisma. I think probably it is harder to acquire in today's complex world than it might have been 20 or 30 years ago. Um, as Stephen Jobs is, is unique. Uh, no, maybe not unique because the founders of Google uh, are, are, are likewise. I had the occasion of uh, being invited to participate in a, in a Harvard uh, panel to choose America's uh, best leaders in the last 10 years. And uh, we had thousands of nominees and uh, we, Stephen Jobs was one of them. We could agree on Stephen Jobs. Uh, we could agree on on Oprah Winfrey, uh, we could agree on the two or three other people, uh, but once we got beyond those, it was very, very difficult. Uh, and I think it, uh, it, it uh, the charismatic leader is is um, we can all yearn to be one, but shit, but, but but a few of us have got the track record that Stephen Jobs. Had. Um, so um, I, 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 there isn't anything that, that I can do in order, order to create a, a charismatic leader. Although I think by uh, adhering to uh, the, the model, which I believe will increase the number of successful decisions, that will go toward building up a track record, which is one of the components of charisma. All right, so Hamza, are we allowed to move to the next question, or do you have anything else to say? Uh, right, that's about it. That's about All right, it. Thank, thank you me. very much, Hamza. Thank you. Okay, uh, we have another question. Uh, let me see if I can request uh, Zulhaimi. Uh, Zulhaimi, I know you have put it question in the chat box, but uh, let me know if you want to speak up, or I can read it for you. Thank you. Hello, it's Jaime. Can you hear us? Hello. Hello, it's Jaime. Okay. Uh, Saudi Arabia. Mhm. Mm yes, Jaime. I think we are losing your voice. So let me read for you, if you don't mind. You have put it in the chat box, and it's a very. Hello. Yeah. Can you? Yes, we can, can hear you. Hear me? You. Can yes, hear me? We... Yeah. You. Okay. Please go ahead. Please uh, ask the question. Yeah. Hello, Zulaimi. Go ahead. Uh, I think we are losing your voice, so let Two me... Two questions. Deciding how to decide, yeah, we... Yeah. I believe the impact of our... Zulaimi, I'm sorry, I've just muted you, I guess. Uh, let me read it for you since you have posted in the chat box and we were losing your voice. So 
You've asked an interesting question. Uh, based uh, based on the research done, is there any difference between male and female decision making process? That is, female leader more autocratic or male given more, giving more freedom? A very good question, and yes, I've got uh, I've published extensively uh, on that uh, that subject. Um, female leaders have are substantially more more participative uh, than their male counterparts, even people doing the same sorts of things. Now, the, the reason for this, I think, is that we, uh, we developed a, a, a stereotype as to what, what, uh, what women should be like, based on uh, for thousands of years the role that women have played in life and uh, is that of the, the socio-emotional leader of the family, the glue that has kept the family together. Uh, and uh, in the main, they have not been the hunters, the gatherers, and the warriors that are associated with more autocratic behavior. Uh, the research that we have done suggests that, that autocratic women are not perceived by either gender very benevolently, very uh, positively. Um, a male can be autocratic, he's the decisive take charge guy, the heroic leader, uh, but a female who behaves the same way is, uh, is, is viewed as a, I won't use the word, but it rhymes with witch. Uh, and uh, and this is true because she's violating a stereotype. Um, so there are forces on on women not to violate this stereotype and to behave more participatively, to display much more inclusive patterns of leadership. Um, there is approximately a 0.9 difference between male leaders and female leaders. Uh, on this scale with women being more participative. It is the second most important demographic factor in determining where a person is on this scale. Does that answer the question? Uh, I think because he was losing his voice, but it's quite an interesting finding you, sh you shared about the decision making and difference between male and female, but uh, Zulhaimi so, so has a supplementary question also, so let me read it for you also, Doctor. In deciding how to decide, I believe we should also look at the impact of our decision to the group, as well as to organization. Where is this element fits in the decision-making model? Now, let me see if I understand that. Uh, the, the impact on the organization? Yeah, it's the impact. Where is the uh, element fits in the decision making model, uh, as well as to the organization? Yeah, impact uh, well, the, or decision making to the group, as well as to the organization. Okay. Well, the uh, the, the the quality of the decision uh, it is concerned with its its impact on the success of the organization. The uh, uh, high quality decision will will increase uh, the uh, the, uh, the degree to which the uh, the goals of the organization are attained. Uh, so that's one respect. Uh, on the human organization, uh, the um, participative decisions will develop, will increase the uh, the strength of the human assets of the organization, which will build talent, will build relationships, which will in the long run make the organizations more effective. Uh, so, um, so in both respects, the decision-making process affects the organization through good decisions and through development. Uh, but participation does use up time, uh, and but it typically leads to uh, uh, to more effective uh, implementation. We are we are finding. Uh, uh, increased uh, use of teams in America. This is a term that was was really borrowed from the Japanese. Uh, they uh, 
they were able to produce higher levels of quality in manufactured goods than anything that was uh, we were capable of in the United States and in Europe. And the, the source of this was the use of uh, uh, high performance work teams, uh, quality control circles in assembly lines in Japan. They were frequently broken down into, into teams, any one of which would stop the line and, and have a meeting to, uh, uh, to solve a problem. Um, so, um, so the Japanese, there's a, a big contrast, and I'm sure this was true, revealed from my document, but a very big difference between the autocratic Chinese and the highly group-centered, participative Japanese uh, on the, the same problems. They were at opposite ends of the scale. Um, as long as I'm talking about, the, about, about where countries are, uh, this may not be responsive to the... Uh, a classic study was done by a, a Dutch associate of mine who found uh, in... he was working for IBM. He found great differences in the 88 countries in the degree of participativeness in these 88 countries. Uh, at that time, we all believed that IBM had roughly the same culture wherever it existed. But the culture was, in fact, very, very, very different uh, in what they didn't use the term participation. Uh, they talked about power distance, uh, the power distance between leaders and followers, which is very much related to inclusiveness in decision making and so on. And the um, they were, were trying to understand these differences among countries. And they found one factor which seemed to be playing a very significant role, and that was latitude. Latitude, closeness to the equator. The further the country was different from the equator, the more participative and the lower the power distance. So it's countries like Denmark and Sweden and Norway and Japan, which are highly participative. And those countries that are closer to the equator, that tend to be much more autocratic, top-down. And the correlation was, uh, I've forgotten the magnitude of it, but it, it, it's minus 0.5 or minus 0.6, something of that order. Um, and the, um, my colleague has produced a map of the world, uh, which is an interactive map. You can click on any country and it will show you the power distance score. Um, and uh, so the, the, what's the explanation uh, of this? The, uh, as you move further away from the equator, the problems of, uh, of, uh, uh, of growing food and uh, pro providing the existence. Excuse me just a minute. Would you please be quiet? I'm talking. Uh, the, um, so the, um, if, if, if the production of food is is uh, is important. People had to work together in order to uh, collaborate in ensuring their survival. And these institutions that are very far away from the equator have maintained many of these institutions and are uh, much more egalitarian, much more participative. Uh, uh, even uh, so, institutions that were developed about uh, oh, 3,000 years ago uh, still have some reflection in society. Does that, uh, does that make any sense? Um, Suleyme, you can... Uh, I think Suleyme is pretty much uh, uh, agreed, I guess. Um, all right, um, let me move because we have only five more minutes, so let me move to another question asked by two quick questions by Haytham Ali, who is the president for DPIC Group. It's a quick question. If uh, any 
um, I would like to ask if Sudanese managers had evaluated before or in what stage that they are. Thank you. Um, I, I missed the first part of that. What kind of managers? Uh, Sudanese. Were you able to evaluate the Sudanese managers and in which state uh, they were? No, I don't. Um, I, uh, as far as I know, I have no data whatsoever on Sudan. Although it's very much in the news today, uh, I have no uh, no data yeah. on. Uh, I, th I thought I had most of the countries uh, represented in my database, but to the best of my knowledge, there is not. Uh, uh, or there's nobody from Sudan. Sorry about that. Yeah. So, uh, um, okay. To another questions uh, again from Mr. Kadir. Um, he is asked me to read why decision making is always related to le leadership when there are comp uh, competent employees who are below the managerial level why decision may oh why, why is it always related to le leadership when there are competent employees who are below the managerial level uh, I, I interpret that as meaning oh I do, why are I think the implication of the question is that the decisions should be made at a lower level in organizations uh, than is currently the case. Why uh, do we I find don't think it's always, uh, but I think he's trying to make a point that why is it always taken, uh, the lead should be taken into consideration when we talk about decision making. Why not about the lower management level? They are equally competitive. Yeah, yes. Uh, pushing decisions for, for, for further down. Why do decisions rise to, to the top? I think that is a is a is a frequent uh, a frequent error. Uh, let me give you one one example of something that uh, I've been associated with. Uh, um, Hilton Hotels is one of the the largest uh, hotel chains in the in the country, and uh, they used to um, to if you stayed in the Hilton Hotel, you'd find a questionnaire asking you to evaluate your stay on a number of dimensions and you're supposed to put this in the mail uh, as you check out the hotel and send uh, send it to Baron Hilton at his ranch in New Mexico. Now I don't know whatever was done with uh, that information. I used to fill it out uh, but I uh, found myself working with a with another Hilton hotel which had adopted a very, very different practice. At the same time, just at the time in which you're paying your bill, uh, you're provided a, a questionnaire in which you evaluated various aspects of the service. And that information was immediately put into a computer. And any problems were immediately sent to that portion of the, the hotel which pertained to your stay, for example, if it was the food department uh, to, to, to the restaurant, they got the immediate feedback. So here's a case in which a, a new information system was designed to short circuit the uh, the uh, the information uh, concerning any problems, immediately get it to the source of the problem instead of sending it up the ladder where it may or may not eventually come down. And by the time it comes down, it's out of date. That, that's what I hear in the question, that all too frequently problems are, are, are left to uh, be solved by the leadership of the organization, whereas the knowledge and the talent for solving these problems uh, occurs below them in the organization. And uh, here is where information technology can play a very important role in 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 getting um, uh, problems solved closer to in the level of the organization in which they occurred, instead of immediately going through this circuitous route to the top. Are we still there? Yeah, yeah. So, Doctor, you okay? Finished up. Doctor Victor, can you hear us? Yes, I'm here. I'm here. Yeah. Okay, so I uh, 
let me just take one last question and that would be it. Uh, it's from Mr. Abrar Ahmed who is asking, what are all the components of Charisma? If one of the component is success created in the past to build up credibility? Certainly one of the components uh, is, uh, is success. That leads to, uh, to charisma. Not the, uh, not the only one. Um, uh, I've been watching the, uh, the Republican debates for the Republican candidate for, uh, for the president. Uh, and it's possible to see differences in charisma in people's answers to questions, the smoothness of their answer, the extent to which they uh, can uh, exude confidence. Uh, this is unrelated, I think, well, not directly related to past success, but I think that there's something about uh, one's, uh, one's style and one, one's demeanor, de demeanor which can uh, convey charisma and results in co people's confidence in, uh, in uh, your answers. Uh, so, so certainly track record is the most important factor. Uh, but beyond that, interpersonal confidence, I think, is, uh, is also present. So is charisma the deciding factor to run a company or a government? A little supplementary question by Brock. Certainly, charisma will enable one to be more autocratic. You, you can be very decisive if, because you've got the power. People are looking to you for direction uh, and uh, believe in you, and uh, they don't uh, they don't have to be involved in decision making if you have charisma. Okay. Oh uh, well, uh, folks. Uh, that would be it. That brings us towards the end of the webinar. Um, I would like to thank Dr. Victor Varum uh, on behalf of Mile for his time and willingness to share his valuable information and experiences with our participants tonight. Also thanks to all of you who participated. Uh, we are glad you could join us and hope this session was helpful for you. Uh, I apologize. We, um, we witnessed some technical difficulties in the beginning but I'm glad that we overcome overcame it. Especially special thank to Dr. Victor Rome who was struggling and finally he made it into the webinar room. I will be emailing you the link to a recorded version of this webinar in a couple of days once it's updated on our blog. Uh, we will also be distributing it to you via email an online evaluation of this webinar. So please do take some time to fill it out. Uh, also, please note our other upcoming high-impact programs in the year 2012 on High Performance Telecom, HPT, a program for Advanced Leadership and Management, Palm 4, and High Performance Governments, HPG2, are currently accepting applications for enrollment and selection. So please do visit our website, www.mile.org, to get more details about these programs and webinars. Thank you once again for joining. and. Uh, Enjoy the rest of your day and evening, uh, and once again, thank you very much, Dr. Victor Rome. Goodbye to everyone. Goodbye, and I will be stopping the webinar, so everybody will be automatically dismissed out. Thank you very much.